Uh, yeah. Well, yesterday uh, I spoke to a lot of people here. <coughs> Sorry, I might do that. Uh, and I realize not everyone here have English as their first or even second language of preference. So I imagine with the translators around who must be doing a great job, it's still hard for some people to follow along. So I'm going to speak slowly because generally I tend to go fast and on stage I tend to go faster. So, uh, you know, people can follow along. That means I might have to skip a few slides here and there uh, to fit in the time that I have, but that should be okay. Thank you for showing up for my talk. I'm really excited about this and hopefully you'll find this interesting and learn something new. A little bit about me. My name is Rishi Jain. I'm here from Bangalore, which is a city in South of India. I like programming, traveling, writing blogs, playing sports and speaking at conferences. I'm also a Manchester United fan so I usually spend my weekend crying. <laughs> I would like to tell you a little bit about Bangalore. Bangalore have a few different versions. <clears throat> we are infamous for the traffic. But to be honest, it's not this bad if you work from home or if you plan your life around going out really late at night or early in the mornings. That's what I end up doing. There's not much traffic. Bangalore can also be this. The city has a really high number of parks and one of the best thing about the city is its weather. Or if, you happen, if I happen to show you around Bangalore, this is what Bangalore will look like for you. This slice of heaven is called dosa. Well, coming to what I do in Bangalore, apart from eating dosa every day, I work at this company called Ombulabs and I'm a senior software engineer there. Ombulabs is a remote-first company based out of Philadelphia. I really enjoy working at Ombulabs as it is a very diverse group of people coming from all kinds of backgrounds and countries, and everyone is nice. So, what do we do at Ombulabs? Here's a nice summary of what all we do at Ombulabs. Do reach out to me if uh, this sounds interesting to you and you have interest in hiring us. One of our offerings is Tune Reports for your Ruby applications. Some of the information I'm going to share today is also from my experience of doing Tune Reports for our clients. Couple of ways we give back to the community are by writing blogs, and you can read our blogs on different topics at the link mentioned above. We also maintain a few open source gems, and you can check them out in the link as well. Well, let's get started with the reason why we all are here for. Let's do a quick poll with a show of hands. Have you, okay, raise your hand if you've heard or come across these. Have you found an N plus one query in the code base or even fixed one? Yeah, a lot of you, great. Heard from your customers that the app has been running really slow for the past few days. All right, yeah. Pretty good. Heard from your senior engineers or your DevOps team that the CPU utilization is very high or the app consumes a lot of memory. Have we deployed something new? Do we know why it's happening? Yeah, congratulations. You all have heard or been around things which have to do with performance monitoring. But this is not it. There are a lot of misconceptions about Rails performance and let's talk them about as well. <clears throat> First one, senior dev things. A lot of times it is assumed that anything around performance improvement and mentoring is an area for senior developers in the team. And as junior developers, their job is to build features that have been asked of them and fix issues. And all the issues related to performance should be caught in the code review by the senior devs. Well, I believe it should not be like this. First, as developers, we should understand the impact of the code we write from a performance perspective. Second, not everything can be caught in the code review by senior developers. 
things will slip through. So it is our duty as developers to be more careful of what we write. During the course of this talk, we'll see how developers can identify issues and help fix them or be, be more aware of the impact of the code. Well, the backend frontend fiasco. Sometimes the engineers writing backend seem to assume that their code works perfectly fine and is fast. It is the issue of rendering and thus it falls under the frontend team's bucket. After all, how can it be slow? It's Rails code, it has to be fast. While the frontend team claims they are just rendering whatever data the backend team is sending them and it is their APIs that take so much of the time to send back the response, they need to check their logs to see what is making their API slow. Meanwhile, this is what really is happening here. Every time we hear something is slow, someone in the room says, let's cache it. It can be a classic mistake made often is assuming whatever is slow can be made fast by caching data. But there are times when it is not true. In fact, it can make things further slow. Maybe the data you are caching is changing too often. And now you have to invalidate the cache, load the cache again. And otherwise you might show stale data and you might end up doing more network requests than you were doing without caching. This is a very common one. Bigger hardware or more hardware will make our app fast. Think of it like this. Bigger highways will not make your cars any faster. It will have a limit to it. It will accommodate more cars for sure. It means more requests in our scenario, but it will not make any of those requests any faster. Now that we have seen some of the common misconceptions around this, let's briefly look at why you should even care about Rails performance monitoring at all. I'll give you four reasons for it and we'll not get into the details of it. I'll skip those part. Scalability, user experience, cost savings, and professional growth. I'm gonna skip these slides in the interest of time. Perfect. Now that we know Rails performance monitoring is important, some misconceptions around it, but if you think about any Rails app, if you break it down into different components, typically it will have a front end, a back end, a database, and a server. In this talk, we'll only talk about back end because that's the time we have. When we talk about back end in the context of performance monitoring and improvement, the most important thing we need to know about is APM tools. Let's look at what is APM, what are APM tools, and what it can do for us. APM stands for Application Performance Monitoring. It is the process of using software tools and telemetry data to monitor the performance of business critical applications. These software tools are also called as APM tools. Let's look at some of the common APM tools that you can use. I'm sure you must have used or heard of these. New Relic, Datadog, Scout APM, and a lot more. Let's look at some of the metrics these tools provide. Request queuing, response time, top transactions, and a lot more. Well, these are only a fraction of the metrics that these APM tools give us access to. And all of them provide insights about how your app is doing, um, resource utilization wise, capacity wise, user experience wise. Let's look at some of these metrics individually and what we can learn about our systems from them. Request queue, it is one of my personal favorite metric. It is basically a measure of how long your request has to wait before it gets picked up for processing by the app server. It is the amount of time that a request must wait before being addressed. This is what a graph can look like for request queue. The request queue time should be between 20 to 50 milliseconds. Anything over that is a sign that something is not right and customers are not having the best of experience. Let's look at the next slide for an example of it. Look at this graph. We see a spike in the request queue time up to 10,000 milliseconds, that's 10 seconds. Obviously, the user at this point would be left frustrated if nothing happens for 10 seconds. The simple reason why request queue time shoots up is that all your existing servers are busy with other requests 
and that request has to wait until a server is available to work on it. So it is directly related to resource allocation. If the request queue time is constantly under 20 milliseconds, then it is an indication that maybe you are over provisioned and you should look at reducing the resources. So when you're adding more servers, you're typically reducing the request queue time. This is another metric that the APMs give us, list of top slowest transactions for your web apps. And you can sort them on different parameters. This gives you a quick insight into which endpoints are critical, that is receive the most traffic and which are slow. So you can fix the issues with those slow endpoints. You can even drill down further for more information about each of them. Things like uh, you can get information around what all stages the request went through, how much time it spent in each step. You can also get metrics around what queries were fired, how much time each query took. So if there's a query that is slow, you can debug that specific query, making that endpoint faster than before. APMs also gives us information about throughput. It shows you when your customer typically access your application. So for instance, if you're planning any system upgrades or major deployments, it would be a good idea to do that when you receive less traffic on your application. Object allocations, this is an interesting one. It is very easy in Rails to not pay attention to the amount of objects we are creating and typically it should not cross 50,000 live objects at any time. Higher than this can lead to slowdowns in the system, can lead to higher memory consumption. Let's look at a very common pattern in Rails applications. In this code, we are fetching all the products and looping through them to update an attribute. It looks pretty straightforward, but there's a problem. The problem lies in product.all. It will load all the products at once in memory. It will shoot up the memory usage of your application and thus affecting your application. How to fix this though? The solution is not to load all the products at once. Instead, use the find each method to load them in batches and thus not creating objects without even realizing it. It is suggested to use the find each method even when you have just started the application that means you do not really have enough data at the moment. Uh, so using all versus find each will not make any difference. But if you start with this approach, you will not be dealing with memory issues later when the database grows. The next matrix of interest is instance restarts. This directly gives you information about when does your instance restarted. Look at this next slide for a weird example. When you see that specific time in the middle of the graph where so many lines are crisscrossed, that is when so many of the instances restarted at a very specific time of the day. It is critical information to try and debug, like what happened during that specific time. You can look at memory, you can look at CPU utilization, throughput, request queue, something that helps you draw an inference of what went down at the time. If you have a theory of what went wrong, APM with its data also help you verify your theory and back it up. In most cases, almost all, when you have a theory but the data is not verifying it, the theory is most likely wrong. Now that we have seen some of these metrics, it's time we look at some of the common mistakes found in Rails applications. Well, N plus one, everybody literally raised their hands. So let's start with that one. First is n plus one query. Look at this query. What we're doing is we're finding all the post and then printing the post's title and the user's username. This is what the log can look like for an n plus one query. Looking at it, this DB had six posts, so it fired seven queries, a query to fetch all the post and six other, six other queries to fetch their individual user's information. This is okay for a small database, but imagine this happening when it has 10,000 posts, let's say. So it would fire so many queries and the response would be really slow for the API. The fix is pretty simple. We need to eager load the user information and now it just fire two queries. It won't matter if it has six posts or 10,000. As simple as this is, 
We find n plus one queries all the time in the Rails applications that we work on for tune reports. Now these are simple n plus one queries that are also easy to fix. Let's look at some of the weird ones. Consider this view code. We're looping through the posts and then rendering different partials based on a condition. This is line which says post dot lots of comments question mark. We're calling this method for each of the post in the collection. Let's look at how this method is defined. This can seem all right at first glance since now we know of preloading so they must, we must have preloaded the comments. Only the problem is with the count method. It fires a database query to calculate the count. So even though the comments are preloaded, there will still be a query fired for each post in the collection as we're calling this method for each post. The fix, again, fix is again simple, replace count with size. The way size works, it will not fire the database query to calculate the size. Small fix, but very easy to make this mistake, which can make your API really slow. Let's look at another method. Here in this one, we're trying to find the first famous comment for the post. A famous comment is when it is liked by let's say more than five people. Now that we know of preloading the data, we can preload the comments for a post. There should not be any extra queries. Unfortunately not. The problem is the where clause in this one. The where clause does not really work well with preloaded data. So it will still go ahead and fire a fresh query every single time this is called in the loop. How to fix this though? Well, the first way, the Ruby way. We can preload all the comments. We can use the enumerables to do the manipulation. In this, we can use the find method to find the mo most famous first comment via Ruby. This way, we do not touch the database at all. But of what, what if we had like lots of comments for each post? Would it still make sense to do the processing on Ruby? Because we'll be storing all these objects in memory after all and fixing memory issues are hard. So here's a second way. We can create an association with the conditions that we want. In this case, liked by people greater than five. And then preload the association while loading the posts. This could be the most optimized way of fixing that one. Well, we know what a menace n plus one queries can be. It is important to know how do we find them. The first is APMs. APM will give you information about the queries which are being fired. It will show you the query that was fired, how many times it was fired. Uh, but APMs do not track everything. So there's a second way. We can use the gem Rack Mini Profiler. It helps us in profiling the performance of any page locally, and we can see all the n plus one being fired in that. And there's another way, easier way. We can use the bullet gem. And I recently found out that you can even run a logger just for logs from bullet. And it makes it super easy to find those queries listed in a log rather than trying to find them in development.log, which can go crazy. Well, Coming to the second common mistake, lack of background jobs. Huh. Imagine this code, the generate invoice and notify method. As the name suggests, it will generate the invoice for the customer and send the notification to the customer at three different places. It will send an SMS, an email, and a WhatsApp message. Let's say it will use a third party service to send an SMS. It will use an SES to send an email and it will use again some third party to send WhatsApp. And all of this will happen while the customer will wait for the response on the screen. This is not the most optimal user experience. We should utilize background jobs here. All the notifications can be sent via a background job so that the customer does not wait on its screen to get a response. But time and again, I've seen this pattern in different Rails applications where some processing that can happen in the background is still being done on the main request. Let's come to the third one, timeouts for third party. Consider the previous example where we were using some third party service to send SMS notifications to our customers. What if the SMS vendor is having their own issues 
with the system and the request which usually sends back the response in 200 milliseconds is now timing out after a default wait of 60 seconds. That means our request will wait for 60 seconds to get the response back from the vendor. And then we will take some action based on that. We should be stricter with timeouts when we're dependent on a third party and not leave everything for default. Ideally, wait for two seconds or maybe five seconds. But if we don't get back the response in that time, handle that case explicitly. Maybe push a job that will retry this later or store an exception somewhere and retry it later. But never wait any vendor if they're taking more than five seconds. It is always a good idea to stay in control of how long a request should wait for its response. Missing DB indexes. This is such a common thing. It is very easy to forget about database indexes. Consider this table users. It has two columns of our interest, name and email. We do a simple query to find the first user with a certain email. In our APMs, we've been seeing that the query is really slow. Let's analyze it further. So we run the explain command on the query. It will give us the query plan for it, which will tell us how the database is going to execute this query. I've seen the five minutes left mark, thank you. Notice that it says SEQ scan, which basically means sequential scan over the whole table. That is, it will scan each row in the table and match the email. That is going to be very slow. Larger the table, the more time it will take. So naturally, the next step is to make this query faster and that would be by adding an index on the table, on the email column, and then measure the change. So when we added the index, let's run explain on it again to measure the change. Notice that it does not say sequential scan anymore. It says index scan using an index. And look at the cost, 8.44. It has come down from 2440 to 8.44. That is massive gain. Missing index is such a common pattern in a lot of Rails application. Look at this query to understand another critical thing about indexes. We have added two indexes to this table. There's a slow index and there's a fast index. We don't know how we have defined those. We learn about them. Let's look at how each of them performs. Look at this graph. The fast index runs in 0.029 seconds and the slow one runs in 0.055 seconds. If you look at the time difference between slow and fast, it is not considerable. I mean, fast is almost twice as fast as the slower one, but still both are quite fast in the real world. Like 0.055 seconds is not slow at all. But what happens when the data volume grows? As the data volume is growing, the time taken by both the indexes to run the query is also growing. Notice at max capacity, the fast one has almost doubled, but the slow one has almost gone 20x. Now the difference between them is too big to ignore. Let's look at how a query is performed with each of those indexes. This is the query plan for the query with slow index. If you pay attention to the last two lines, it says access predicate on section field and then filtering on the results it got from above, which basically means it is filtering on ID 2 based on the result it got from access from section. This is the query plan for the query with fast index. Look at the last line. It says access predicate on section and ID 2s together. So it would be useful to know what were those slow and fast indexes. This is the for the slow index. The index was defined on section ID1 and ID2. These were the fields. And the query was done on section and ID2. And if you recall the query plan for the slow index, the access was done for only section while ID2 was filtered out. The order of how you define the index is very important. Here, because it was expecting an ID1 field to be present before ID2 and it was not in the query, the index could not be applied for both the query.
and you can guess the next one here the order is changed because id2 is second in order the query applies the composite index of section and id2 and makes the query faster this is all i had in rails performance monitoring these are some of the resources uh, nate bakopek's performance workshop and all of his material are great if at all you're interested in this kind of uh, stuff and then there's a book SQL Performance Explained, which is a great resource for learning more about databases and performance improvement. And yeah, I, I hope you found this interesting. Uh, that's me. Thank you for attending. And yeah, thank you.